Alrighty, people. I think we're live, and I think the internet connection looks good. You will notice from the background I had to change uh, settings because we're still in isolation with one of the kids, um, and they have Zoom classes, and we're in a confined area, so I don't want to hear their Zoom classes, so I am moving into a separate room with doors closed. Can everybody hear me, and can everybody see me? Without doing the uh, joking F in the chat. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, I, if we're not good, okay, perfect. So, Robert is on his way. I see Gad Sad in the studio, so to speak, the StreamYard studio. And this is amazing because Gad Sad is a fellow Montrealer. I mean, I guess he's, he's from Lebanon, but has been in Montreal longer than I've been alive, I think. Um, I've been following him on Twitter. I just read or audio listened to his book, The Parasitic Mind, and it was a, a very, very interesting, worthwhile read for anybody who has not yet read it. And actually, I've been, I mean, I've seen Gad Sad's YouTube stuff for a little while, and you know, it's just funny how worlds, uh, they don't collide, they just end up merging or, or interacting. And so after reading The Parasitic Mind, um, and Robert Barnes and I started doing these Wednesday uh, sidebars, we reached out to Gad and Gad said yes. So we've got him for about an hour, so I'm not going to waste too much time on the intro. I'll be reading the chat. Any questions that I don't get to, I'm going to keep looking in the chat for some questions. And um, ask away. And this is going to be amazing because many of you know him as the Gad father. Uh, I only found that pun out a little later on. But let's just, let's just get it going here because I see him and he's looking ready to talk. Gad, how you doing? Hey, what's up, David? Good to see you. No, th thank you very much for doing this. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. It's fun to get to interact with the people who you've only listened to or heard or read of. Um, so I, I suspect everybody out there knows who you are, but in the event that they don't, 30-second, one-minute bio before I start asking you some of my, uh, my personal questions that I've had. So, I mean, my professional bio, should I give you? Is that oh yeah, well, yeah, and we'll get into the, we'll get into your uh, you know your, your life afterwards. So professionally, uh, I've been at Concordia since 1994 when I finished my PhD at Cornell University. I'm someone who applies evolutionary thinking, so evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, to understand human behavior in general and consumer behavior in particular. That's why I'm housed in a business school. Uh, I've also held some visiting professorships at Dartmouth College at Cornell, my alma mater. And I spent a few years at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, I've also been, I guess that's how some of your viewers might know me, someone who's been very actively engaged in trying to push back against some of the lunacy that gets starts off on campuses. And uh, here I am trying to spread good ideas and hopefully defeat bad ones. Okay, so starting from the very, I just want to go back to the very beginning because I listened to the, I listened to your book. I don't, I can't read anymore without falling asleep. So Audible is like the greatest blessing ever, especially when you end up driving kids around a lot. It, it, it works well when they're sleeping. Born in Beirut, Lebanon, and you, you, you left at what age? So I left when I was 11. Uh, I was born in 64. So I was there till 75. Um, we were part of the last remaining sort of steadfastly uh, dogged Lebanese Jewish community. Most of my extended family had already left Lebanon prior to the start of the civil war because the writing was somewhat on the proverbial wall. But my family had stayed, my immediate family, my parents and so on. Uh, although some of my siblings, all of whom were much older than me, had already left Lebanon before the civil war broke out. But I was a child, 10 of 10 years old when the war broke out. And so in April 1975, the civil war broke out. It's, it still remains the standard by which all forms of brutality are measured against. The Lebanese civil war was extraordinarily brutal because it was founded along or organized along very tribal lines, religion of which was one of them. And as Lebanese Jews, it wasn't you know, feasible to remain in Lebanon. And so we we left. We experienced some horrors in the first year of the war, but then we left. My parents, after we emigrated to Montreal, kept returning to Lebanon for the next uh, four years until 1980, at which time during one of their return trips to Lebanon, they were kidnapped by Fatah, one of the Palestinian militia groups. 
bad stuff happened, but luckily we were able to, I say we, I mean, I, I had nothing to do at the time with freeing them. I was a 15 year old kid, but then, you know, people were able, some of their friends were able to free them, friends in high places. And then since 1980, none of our family has ever returned. Although I've been invited many times to go back, uh, you know, by very prominent people, uh, but I've never felt safe enough to really indulge that kind invitation. All right. Now I see Robert's in, so I'm going to bring him in in a second, right after I bring up a super chat. Happy Passover. Thank you all very much. And again, so, someone asked, do you speak Hebrew? Okay, <laughs> very and I understood what that meant. Now we got Robert in the house, so now we have the full sidebar. Do we like this angle or do we like no, definitely not like that? Or do we like this? This makes us seem as though we're all equal, which of course is not true, but fine, let's go with equality. <laughs> Perfect. Now, again, um, and I know Robert's gonna have his questions, but uh, you know, I, the one I've been thinking of since I heard the anecdote from the story from your book. It, it, it was, I think it's the most striking thing that I recall from the book is the pomegranate story yeah. uh, from your childhood. And so I, I mean, I want you to tell, tell that story quickly for anybody who hasn't read the book. And, and if this will set up the it must feel like as a human to go through that experience, to see how people can change people who you've known for the better part of your life, from what I understand, change overnight, given social contexts. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you call it the pomegranate story because, uh, you know, I was hoping that people would retain exactly the, the vividness of the terror that I experienced. So the pomegranate story is something that I talk about in chapter one. It was during the, uh, well, the time that the civil war had broken out in Lebanon, but things were pretty much under lockdown at that point because it was just massive fighting going on all the time. And so on a given evening, uh, we had, there's a knock on the door. And usually in the context of the Lebanese civil war, I mean, it's not as though people are just coming to visit you because there's really, it's, it's impossible to walk around. There are snipers everywhere. Militias are pulling people out of their cars, executing them. So it's not, so if somebody's knocking on your door, it's usually not a good thing. And so I actually go to the door and ask who it is. And the gentleman who answers me on the other side of the door says, oh, I am so-and-so. I'm the guy, so I don't know if you, and I, I try to explain this as best as I could in the book. So you know how today you have these disposable things that you could roll to to dry your hands when you go to the bathroom? Uh, disposable tissues, but in the old days, those tissues were actually- The cloth. Yes, there were cloth rolls, and there would be someone who would come to your house who would take the used cloth and then replace it with a new roll, and then a week or two later, that person would come over again. And so the person who would do that service for us, who we didn't know otherwise, you know, for no other reason other than the fact that he would come and change the roles, said, oh, I'm here with some friends. We, we just returned from uh, the mountains where we, in, in Arabic, pomegranate is the men. We picked up some, uh, some pomegranates and we'd like to give you some. So of course I was very scared. Luckily I wasn't stupid enough to open the door. I went to try to get my mother. My mother tries to go and get uh, a male visitor who was at our house and who was stuck at our house because of the brutality of the fighting, was too cowardly to even come to the door. I, and I remember the, the feeling of disgust that I had at how cowardly he was, even as a 10-year-old boy at that point. My father wasn't uh, in the house. So we ended up calling uh, this police division called, in, if. Translated in English, it just means 16, the 16 division, which at the time, luckily, was still somewhat operational. And thankfully, they showed up at the house. Everybody comes into our home, and the head policeman or head cop uh, asks these guys, including this, this gentleman who, who used to come and change our role, well, what are you, what are you doing here? He says, oh, well, we brought some pomegranates for thee. These are customers of mine, and I thought we'd stop. So the cop tells him, it's the middle of massive fighting. It's the middle of the night. You know that this family is here without the husband and you're coming with a bunch of guys to give them pomegranates. If I catch you here again, there will be trouble. And then the gentleman in question uh, looks at us and says, I'll be back for you. And luckily we left Lebanon before he could come back and finish that, which he was going to to start that day. 
And so that really captured for me, even though I saw incredible brutality in Lebanon, it really, the reason why I shared that story, because it showed you, you know, how, you know, any wrong decision you made, had I been stupid enough or naive enough to open that door, who knows what would have happened. Uh, had the 16 uh, division not answered our call, which could have very easily not happened, who knows what would have happened, but it captures the, the, the ad hoc nature of whether you lived or died in Lebanon. Robert, you want to, uh, I, we should go, we should go one question each before we get into sure. some discussion. Hi, Robert. Nice to meet you. Yeah, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, the, it's a question I ask a lot. Uh, was it that experience? Was it something in your uh, family upbringing, your cultural upbringing that allowed you and sort of empowered you to be a very independent uh, thinker and particularly to challenge the sort of what you describe in the parasitic mind, this sort of totalitarian mindset that many of your fellow academics are unwilling to speak out about, even though they will privately say uh, say so? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I touched upon it briefly in, in the first chapter where I talk about the fact that humans are really an inextricable mix of their genes and their environment. Now, why do I say that? Because, of course, part of who I am is a product of the unique life experiences and life trajectory that I've had. And so growing up in the Lebanon with the brutality that I saw uh, undoubtedly shaped me in ways that might be different from you know, your experiences. That said, though, there is the unique combination of genes that constitutes the personhood of God's side is that, in other words, irrespective of any environment that I would have faced, you know, I am who I am and I've always been someone, uh, civil war or not, who's been very irreverent against authority, who questions things. So for example, I talk about in the book when my father would take me reluctant, I mean, reluctantly for me to uh, the synagogue used to be called uh, Magen Avraham in, in the Jewish quarters in, in, in Beirut. And I would ask him as a little boy, five, six years old, you know, when you have to stand up, sit down, do the Macarena, shuffle right, shuffle left mm -hmm. in your religious services. And I would ask, well, why, why are we doing this? And, you know, his answer was sort of, you know, just shut up, just, just do. And, I, and that was sort of one of the first conscious realizations that I didn't re really appreciate this kind of, dogmatism because I needed to understand. And so I think it really, who I am is really in large part, just because of for the, no, for the same way that I have green eyes, that's just the random combination of my genes. I'm someone who's very, very uh, slighted by attacks on truth. I'm someone who cherishes truth and freedom, uh, partly shaped by the reality that I saw in Lebanon, but partly just because of my genes. It's so for anybody out there who doesn't fully appreciate it, like I'm from Montreal, Gad's in Montreal. I applied to Concordia for communications back in 2000 something uh, when I was applying to McGill for philosophy as well to pick my universities. People don't really appreciate that, like what we refer to as not indoctrination, but rather like the left leaning nature of universities today. It's always been around to some extent or another. And as far as it went politically, Concordia University was sort of I would call it leftist, but you know they they had incidents where back in 2002 they blocked Netanyahu from speaking, and there were protests and riots. It's always been on that side of the the spectrum, and so the I mean, my question is, you know, you're there, you're a tenured professor, you've made a name for yourself, and you're well respected. How have you always been like this, or did you become like this? And once you became like this, did you notice it got a little harder to exist in the atmosphere in the environment of Concordia? Right. Uh Look, I've always been someone who has fought against various forms of orthodoxy. Now, it, 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 that fight manifested itself in different ways. So, for example, in my scientific work, as I explained uh, in the intro when you asked me to, to briefly summarize my professional background, the fact that I have sought to Darwinize the business school, meaning apply evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to understand how consumers behave, how employers behave, how employees behave. In other words, really apply Darwinian principles and understanding uh, business-related behaviors. That itself was originally very galling to most of my colleagues because to them, the idea that uh, you, know, you would use the same principles to explain consumer behavior as you would to explain the behavior of the do your dog and the mosquitoes and giraffes was, was you know, completely heretical. And so... 
I already had started seeing the kind of penchant or instinct that academia, uh, you know, is rife with, which is, you know, don't don't rock the boat, don't say anything. Now, of course, it it has, it has only gone on steroid later on in my career, where I've really become much more publicly engaged. At first, it was restricted to my scientific pursuits. Uh, look, there hasn't been any direct, uh, you know, we're going to fire you, although, yes, you're right, I'm tenured. Uh, what has happened, regrettably, although, you know, I should, I should truly say that Concordia has given me uh, an environment that has allowed me to, to be free in, any, in every possible way that I can. What is regrettable, the way that I think I have been punished, uh, is that I'll just give you a very concrete example, given the current reality. My, my book, by any measure, has been a gigantic success. Concordia has not yet put out a single tweet, a single message, a single, right? So, so they will promote someone being quoted for some banality in the Outremont grocer, but someone who has a best-selling book around the world is somehow invisible. So uh, I've been denied a chaired professorship now for four years, even though I held the chaired professorship, the highest chaired professorship for 10 years and my scientific productivity has only massively increased. So I think there, there are tensions there, uh, but I certainly can't state that they've tried to, you know, uh, fire me or anything like that. But I think what's happened is they just try to pretend as though I don't exist, which is really, <laughs> frankly, hurtful and shameful because you would think that someone who's doing, I mean, I kind of live in two fractured realities, right? I, I open my emails, and I have 10,000 emails from professors from around the world telling me that, forgive me, I'm not trying to be immodest, but that I'm their hero. I'm the hero of academia. But then my home university somehow doesn't know that I exist. So I think that's shameful. Hopefully it will change. But this is the, this is the cards that I've been dealt. And so I'll go with it. One interesting thing about uh, your book, The Parasitic Mind, is your writing style I found very impressive in the sense that you managed to be polemical yet philosophical, academic yet accessible. In my experience, a lot of people in your field and in academia in general really find have difficulty translating uh, their ideas to a broader audience. Where did you learn that skill set? I well, in a sense, it's kind of a, a, a you're asking the exact same question as your previous question but for a different phenomenon. And my answer would be, it's largely driven by the unique genetic makeup that makes who I am. And I have then developed those skills so that I can reach a broader audience. I have specifically sought out to break out of the ivory tower of you know, peer reviewed journals. But the original ability to do what you so kindly described stemming from my book really comes from my very open personality. So for example, uh, I take great pride thinking back of my high school days. So I went to a high school where, depending on where the exit was located, it was a very big high school. So this exit would be called the street name where that exit was located. And in these different exits, you know, the stoners were here, the disco guys were here, the the geeks hang out there, the the jocks were in the other. And as typically happens in click high schools. It's part of you know being a teenager. Uh, you you tend to not you know transport yourself across these different niches, except I did. In other words, I was able to be equally popular. Well, I was a jock. I was the star soccer player, so the jocks loved me. I was a top student, so the geeks loved me. Uh, I was the music. So I've always had a very very open personality that allows me to you know tailor my approach in dealing with different people, right? So uh, I didn't like the fact in academia that when you write a paper, you know, you're probably going to have, if it's a very, very successful scientific paper, a hundred people cited after five, 10 years, a hundred people. Well, probably the number of people who are going to watch the stream is going to be a lot more than a hundred. Now, I don't mean to compare a YouTube stream to publishing a peer-reviewed academic articles. There's room for both. And I understand that the reach is different, but also life is about opportunity costs. And so, you know, I very quickly decided I want to reach out, reach out to a much larger audience. Hence my connection with Joe Rogan. We, be, we become very good friends. Uh, 
I started my YouTube channel before any academics would have ever thought of doing something similar because it really, I think, comes... I, I've never done the test officially, but if I were to do the test on the big five to see how I score on openness, I probably am off the chart. And so I think the writing that you so kindly described about me for, for my book really stems from that open spirit. I, I'm trying to... I, I take great pride that a corrections officer writes to me and says, I loved your book, right? I'm not only trying to reach the highfalutin Stanford professor. I'm, I'm very happy if he or she also loves my work, but I love that the, uh, the private in the Canadian military loved the book. I'm trying to reach everyone, zero uh, haughtiness, complete humility, hence I'm the professor of the people. It's interesting, actually, because listening to your book versus listening to Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent versus listening to Thomas Sowell's uh, uh, Black, Red, Next, White Liberals. I mean, I've been listening to all three of them, and it is Sowell's, Sowell's sort of like right in the middle. Chomsky's on the furthest extreme of what you just described, and you're on the other end, which is, yeah, it, it's accessible, it's easy to understand, and it has phrases that you don't lose, like expressions that you don't lose, like sneaky effort, for example. But um, I, again, I got to ask you, and I think I know my the answer, but if there was one chapter in your book that you think got you into the most, say, public trouble or that, 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 that stirred the pot the most, which chapter do you think it would be? You know, luckily, to be honest with you, I haven't had that much uh, blowback. And oftentimes people will ask me, you know, how come, I mean, knock on wood, how come you're not cancelable? How come people, I mean, I, I truly do say, I mean, by any given Tuesday morning, I've probably tweeted more things than the next 25 guys who've been canceled. And I always say, well, it helps to have this kind of skin tone. It helps to have to come from the Middle East. It helps that you have you scored, you have the holdest, you have the highest hand in victimology poker. Uh, it helps that all of my positions are based on rigorous, well articulated positions. Uh, it helps that I think, I'd like to think that I have that warm smile that makes me a bit more approachable than other people. So because of this, you know, confluence of factors, I'm sometimes literally surprised. I mean, of course I received hate. Just a few days ago, I received a really nice uh, message from a kind of Himmler appreciation uh, society <laughs> member. So I get tons of death threats. So but regarding the parasitic mind, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to say, oh, there was this massive backlash. So I can't really point to any chapter. I mean, I suspect that if I were to guess what could have caused the the biggest uh, furor, uh, given all of the different sacred cows that I have uh, tried to, to critique in the book, it's probably my nomological network uh, where I try to answer the question: Is Islam an inherently peaceful or or not or non peaceful religion? But even there, I receive tons of emails from people from the Middle East who say. Thank you. If only you ran the Middle East, it would be a much better place. So I think most reasonable people really see that I'm coming from a place of purity, trying to hopefully protect foundational values of the West. And therefore, I don't get nearly as much hate as you would otherwise think. Has Facebook fixed their suspension where because you shared that the email sent to you that was you know hateful speech at you, they considered you the author of the hate speech and right. have they fixed that? And I, I'm still you know it's shocked that that's still happening, but particularly to someone of your status. Well, I'm, I'm I'm glad that I'm speaking to two lawyers because hopefully maybe one day someone will file some kind of collective action lawsuit against these these folks. It's just unbelievable. They have fixed it. But then I don't know if it's a conspiratorial bent that I'm engaging in, but literally within a few hours of fixing it, they sent me another warning that a 2018 post, so they went back almost four years ago, where I posted, so I don't know if either of you gentlemen know, do you know who Tommy Robinson is? For sure. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So Tommy Robinson is someone who, who's been on my show, and I invited him on my show when, of course, most people wouldn't have invited him, precisely because I thought it was worthwhile to talk to him. And so at one point, he was being hauled off by the British authorities because he was reporting about the grooming gangs and all that in Britain. And so I, I just put up, you know, a, a very meek, you know, don't buy into that he's this Nazi and so on. Uh, so I was just publicly defending him in terms of how he was being portrayed. They just came after me now 
four years after the fact to say that I'm in violation and it, it doesn't meet their community standards. And, you know, it really be behooves you to understand what do you mean? Like, am I allowed to defend Tommy Robinson or is it illegal to defend Tommy Robinson? Which community standards are you going against if you say, look, don't call him a Nazi. He's, he's hardly a Nazi. So it's, it's baffling. But so, yes, their original thing has been reversed. For those of you who don't know, by the way, it was a, a guy who wrote me uh, saying basically that I was a dirty Jew and so on. And so I literally just took a screenshot of his, his post. So Facebook uh, banned me for hate speech when the hate speech was targeting me. I think they actually did this, if I'm not mistaken, they did the same thing to Avi Amini when he had his run-in with Jim Jeffries and he secretly recorded the meeting to show that he was not what Jim Jeffries said he was and he posted it to Facebook and then they went after his posting revealing oh. what Jim Jeffries... It, it's happened... If Someone in the chat, correct me if I'm wrong, but it happened to Jim Jeffries. It's the ultimate lunacy uh, where it, when, when someone is either attacked privately or even publicly... And then they try to defend themselves on another social media platform. They get into trouble for posting the offensive statements in the first place. Uh, and so they're basically defamed or harassed publicly or privately or on another platform and unable to defend themselves on another. So uh, I, I saw this happen to you and I saw they reinstated it. But I, I wouldn't say it's I, my, my ref reflex would be it's not conspiratorial. It's not like there's a human doing this. Your, your channel just gets your whole page gets now put in a bad zone in Facebook. Yeah. And they're running AI to see what you've been posting in the back. And I'm sure Tommy Robinson's own, just his name, is enough to get you into trouble on Facebook. And it happens, by the way. I mean, on YouTube, my stuff gets demonetized quite regularly. Although I would say over the last few months, it's been less than it has been in the past. In the past, I could almost guarantee that upon posting anything, the default value is that they would demonetize and then I'd have to appeal it. But uh, uh, on LinkedIn, I've had several of my uh, posts censored. So, for example, at one point, I criticized, uh, at the time he, ha he wasn't yet uh, president, I criticized Joe Biden. Basically, I made the point that, you know, he, he hadn't done much in 47 years. You know, why do you think that now it's going to be any different? So, I mean, it, it was about as meek as you can imagine. I mean, with, with some flowery... Gag, satire, and sarcasm, but you know, there's no, there's no swear words or anything, right? Uh, and they banned it and you know, put me in violation or whatever, uh, because it was a form of harassment and bullying. So, I mean, just really stop and think about it. I mean, th this is a guy who's about to become president of the United States. Here is a Canadian professor posting that. Someone who hasn't done much in 47 years, according to my view, might not do much once he becomes president. That's it. That was viewed as targeted harassment and bullying. So, I mean, you, you, I mean, Orwell couldn't have envisioned such a reality, but yet that's now the, the reality every day. And it, it, it is, it's amazing because they have these terms that are so uh, fluid that it's harassment of a public figure who's about to become president potentially. And they have it on YouTube as well, you know, like, what would be legitimate critique if they want to interpret it that way can be swapped into targeted harassments if they want to go the other way. Just right. to bring up Liz Towell's uh, chat, she says, is Dr. Sad getting involved with counterweight.com, Helen Pluckrose, organiz organizing to counter the nonsense? I vaguely heard about this project. Uh, I have never really connected with uh, Helen uh, or, the, or James, although Pete I know well. I mean, they're the three grievance studies people. Uh, so I, I'm not sure. They certainly haven't reached out to me, but I'm I'm vaguely aware of what she's trying to do, and I, I support her efforts. All right, Robert, before I get back to you here, Michael Sutherland says, Mike Sutherland says, Don Cherry recently said that he preferred a time when the prime minister and the village idiot were two different people. Any comments on this, Dr. Said? And on the subject, for anybody who's American and doesn't know what happened to Don Cherry, a, a Canadian icon, uh, Cancelled overnight, and I mean cancelled in the sense of cancelled because of a you people comment, which I, I think if anyone were inclined to give someone the benefit of the doubt, they could have easily given him the benefit of the doubt and not interpreted it in the most intolerant, racist way that they did. But society is what it is, uh, 50 plus years, and having said much worse things than that in the past, gone overnight. Uh, Robert, you if you want me to comment about Justin very briefly, uh or the prime minister. Uh, 
you just have to go on the internet and uh, look for a quote, a long quote that I have that's become apparently a, a viral meme of itself where I'm basically, I had appeared on a podcast, I think it was a South African show, uh, where the gentleman had asked me about what I thought about Justin Trudeau, and then someone took my exact words and made a meme out of it. But to summarize it briefly, at the time, I've now been a professor for 27 years, but this was four years ago. So at the time, I was saying that I've been a professor for 23 years. And if I were to take of all the thousands of students that I've had as undergraduates, I mean, I've had students of, at all levels, but I was talking here about undergrads. Uh, if I took all of my undergraduate students and found the absolute dumbest student that I've ever had, that student would be roughly 100 times smarter than Justin Trudeau. Uh, and that wasn't hyperbolic. I'm, I'm being pretty literal. Uh, and so that's what I think of Justin Trudeau. Now, I think the reason why he is that, I don't think he's diabolical. I don't think he's, uh, you know, I mean, inherently nefarious, malignant. I think that he is exactly what I describe in the parasitic mind, which is he is a product of an educational system that has parasitized his brain with every single one of the idea pathogens that I describe in the parasitic mind. And therefore, he is what he has learned. And so he apes every single one of those positions. So I think it really comes, in his case, not from being a bad person, but from someone who's truly uh, misguided in all of the progressive unicornia nonsense. Uh, yeah, in that respect, in terms of your book, you also mentioned in there how education has effectively become more indoctrination and acculturation rather than teaching the methods and modes of learning. Like when uh, when we went to law school, what we're taught is you're here to learn how to think like a lawyer, not necessarily any specific subject matter or interpretive filters of the world. But that, in fact, is what education has, has sort of gone away from enlightenment ideals, doesn't teach the institution, doesn't teach the means of reason and using certain skill sets that you talk about. Has that been a shift that you've witnessed in academia or has it always been present? Uh, well, it's gotten worse with a lot of these idea pathogens, which if you'd like, it might be instructive to go over a few at some points that people, because I'm saying idea pathogens, people might not have an idea what I mean. Look, there are certain ideas that are perfectly anti-scientific, anti-critical thinking. And they originally were spawned, you know, more in the humanities and in some of the activist fields within the social sciences. And slowly but surely, as I had been predicting for well over two decades, they've now found their way even within the more, you know, science-based social sciences, within the natural sciences. In other words, no no field is uh, is any longer protected from the nonsense. And of course, as I have predicted for a long time, some people would say to me, oh, but you know, who cares about these idiotic ideas, you know, as long as they are in some esoteric department of the humanities. And I always tell people, the people who are taking those courses will one day become your prime ministers, will become your HR department heads. And that's exactly what's happened. That's why we now see the acceptance of cancel culture, the acceptance of identity politics as a as a good way to organize society. Someone who comes from Lebanon can tell you identity politics is not the way you want to go in organizing your society. So I think what's what I see, so to answer your question, hopefully not too long-winded away, some disciplines are a bit more protected against these bad ideas because they are not as fully decoupled from reality. In other words, there are consequences to your imbecilic ways. So you, in engineering or in the business school, you're less likely to have these idiotic ideas because the, the veracity of your ideas are going to be tested repeatedly against reality. So you can't build a postmodernist bridge if you are a civil engineer. There is no postmodernist physics. There is no postmodernist econometric model of consumer choice. You either build a model that really captures heterogeneity of consumer choice or you're out of the market. I can't charge the kind of hourly rate I charge in consulting with companies if I teach them about post-modernist advertising. So I am rooted in a reality. So my ideas are repeatedly under a stressor of a feedback loop and may being measured to reality. But in some other fields, then your question is really on point in that uh, they've completely rejected critical thinking. As a matter of fact, critical thinking is white supremacy. Mathematics is the white supremacy. 
Look, four or five years ago, I uh, uh, announced on my YouTube channel, I, I have a mathematics background, pure mathematics background. And so I had posted on my YouTube channel, satirically, of course, but for those of you who wouldn't know me, they wouldn't know that I'm being satirical. I, I posted the fact that I had founded a new discipline called social justice mathematics. And so I took all of these uh, mathematical properties, you know, irrational number. And I said, well, we, you know, this is, this is language that, you know, marginalizes mental health issues. We shouldn't be using irrational. And I just went through a whole incredible list. I received tons of emails from mathematicians who say they just sit there, watch these clips and crack up laughing. Well, guess what? You know, my prophetic satire always ends up becoming reality, <laughs> regrettably so. And so a few years later, yes, there is now social justice in mathematics. Math is racist and so on. So this is why I attack those disciplines, because not only are parents paying a tremendous amount of money, I mean, maybe less in Canada, but in general, they're paying a lot of their hard earned money to send uh, their kids to school where they are fully, fully decoupled from any valuable education. But as someone who has dedicated their life to trying to understand the world and in, in whichever small fear, sphere of the world I'm, I'm operating in, it offends me to see this nonsense. So for example, I'll just mention one quick idea of pathogen, then we can discuss others if, if, if you'd like. Postmodernism is a dreadful idea of pathogen. It's, it's, it's one that rejects critical thinking, right? The more obscurantist you are, the, most, the, the more difficult, impenetrable the gibberish is, uh, the, the better it is, right? Uh, you reject objective truth because everything is based on subjectivity. Everything is relative. Well, how could you be a scientist and wake up in the morning if everything is uh, constrained by subjectivity? Don't you wake up in the morning thinking that there are natural laws that need to be discovered or statistical regularities that should be uncovered? So a lot of these movements, Robert, are perfectly terroristic against the idea of having critical thinking as, as a laudable pursuit. It, it's grotesque, and that's why I fight against them. How much do you think universities are in particular the super spreaders of the most perilous pathogens uh, infecting our ideas and discourse. All of the idea pathogens come from the university, every single one of them, or certainly every single one that I thought was worthy of including in the parasitic mind. Uh, so Orwell had intimated, intimated a similar sentiment to what I'm about to say. It truly takes intellectuals to come up with some of the dumbest ideas, right? You have to be super educated to be this dumb. Now, I don't say this to be uh, shocking because I, I live it, right? That's the ecosystem that I exist in, right? So not only are all these idea pathogens originally spawned by academics, but also I, I see, for example, so I talk in the book in chapter one, I talk about the, you know, should you be a stay in your lane professor or should you be someone who, uh, expands to other intellectual theories. So I'm, I'm the exact opposite of a stay in your lane professor, not only in my scientific career in that I published in medicine and in politics and in economics and in psychology and in business and in evolution. I go wherever I think I have an interesting thing to say about a particular scientific problem, but I'm also a not stay in your lane in that I appear on your, uh, uh, stream and I don't think I'm I'm too good to be speaking to non-academics, right? So I am anything but a stay in your lane professor. Most professors are completely the opposite of that. So they are incredibly smart when it comes to understanding the uh, you know the the molecular structure of some uh, diamond, uh, but ask them to speak about anything outside of that, and they're baffling you know bumbling morons. And, and I think that's a real shame because in the same way that an athlete who plays soccer should also be fit enough to do sit-ups, a professor, even though they may be an organic chemist, should be able to have the critical thinking ability to weigh in on other things. After all, they went to a mental gym called an education, and yet most of them are co just complete bubbling idiots. Get, get, was, it, was it from the book where you said, someone said uh, an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less? No, I didn't say that in the book, but I'm, I'm familiar with that sentiment. No, it's an interesting thing. And, and what I've just, what I found is that the stay in your lane idea becomes in practical world 
just listen to what the authorities in other fields say without any form of questioning or rational, rational thinking or critical thinking. And it's led to, on the one hand, you know, a, a scientific dogma in certain fields and in other fields, a blind adherence to whatever the flavor of the day is in terms of uh, accepted, uh, accepted religious or ideological thinking. Um, the, the, and, and, you know, going back to what you said earlier about, you know, Trudeau having been being the product of his education and Robert and I are we're, we're noticing this in real time now is that the millennial generation are now working their ways up into positions of power, judges, lawyers, etc. And you can see how entire fields and entire systems can be, I want to say infiltrated, but can be poisoned with the with the the ideological pathogens or the idea pathogens. Exactly, exactly right. This is why I get so frustrated when someone writes to me and says, you know, why do you use all your your intellectual prowess and your platform to you know discuss these social justice warrior issues? And and in chapter one, I, I try to address this right away and I say, My God, you don't get it if you think this is some trivial eccentricity, you know, that I just want to talk about on some cool YouTube shows shows. I mean it's everything, right? I mean, what differentiates us from any other animal is our capacity. We have this big prefrontal cortex that allows us to reason. And yet, rather than sort of moving forward in the direction away from the, I mean, to like the enlightenment, the scientific revolution four or 500 years ago led us to these glorious flourishing societies in the West. And now we are slowly chipping away at every single one of those foundational values whether it be the promulgation of identity politics or whether it be my truth is superior to the truth. No, nobody gives a shit about your truth, right? Your truth is your, my truth is that this was my Lebanese experience. So I can share with you my autobiography to highlight a point. But when I am adjudicating scientific issues, my truth doesn't matter. There is no Lebanese Jewish way of knowing. There's the scientific method way of knowing. That's the epistemological tool that we use so that we liberate ourselves from the shackles of our personal identity. That's what makes the scientific method the incredible epistemology that it is. And yet today, at all universities, we have what I just said would be considered epistemological racism, because how dare you say that the scientific method is the only way what about the indigenous way of knowing? What about the whatever? No, no, there is no indigenous way of knowing. Now, what there is, is for example, if indigenous people have lived in a particular ecosystem for 10,000 years, then they have unique knowledge about the flora and the fauna of that ecosystem. So that if I am a scientist who is studying that particular fauna or flora, of course I will go to the indigenous people who've lived there for thousands of years to seek their help in understanding whatever phenomenon I'm studying. But in adjudicating scientific phenomena within that indigenous environment, there is no indigenous way of knowing versus the epistem. There's only one epistemology in town. There's only one party in town, and it's called the scientific method. And as you probably both know, and I discussed this in The Parasitic Mind, the I don't know if he's still in, in, in office, but there was a the Quebec minister of the environment had had to issue, you know, he was uh, labeled a, you know, a Nazi and a racist because when he tried to argue that why should we have an indigenous calculus when we're judging uh, the environmental impact of certain projects and so on, uh, isn't it just the scientific method that we should be using? He was feather and tarred. I mean, so think about it. If in the 21st century, the, the Quebec minister of the environment, if, if, I'm, if I'm remembering his title correctly, can't say that the scientific method is the epistemology de rigueur. That's not a good place to be in society, right? It's an amazing thing, actually. Like the identity politics, the my truth, the something I said on Twitter, you know, when someone starts a sentence with as a, nine out of 10 times, what's going to come is going to be sort of irrelevant to the, the issue. And you know, I have identity thing. I have an identity. I have multiple identities, a linguistic minority, a religious minority uh, that one can invoke at any point in time. And the reason why I never ever discuss them is because they never serve as the basis for a justification of my beliefs or undermining someone else's beliefs. 
I, I like the discussions about the, the, the identity of an individual to get to know who they are, how they got to where they are, what challenges they overcame. But as far as it goes for legitimacy of ideas, you know, the starting off the sentence with as a blank, fill in the blank is not going to add any more credibility to the statement. And it's not going to undermine anybody else's position on the issue unless it's one of those exceptional things where the experience uh, makes the reality. But by and large, it's just, you know, people have gotten so uh, at ease with justifying anything they believe based on their feelings and their identity history that there is no reality above and beyond the individual, which is, is not a good thing, I think. No, you're, 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 you're exactly right. And uh, I, you know, related to this idea of identity and so on is another uh, set of idea pathogens that I refer to as the die religion, the diversity, inclusion, and equity. And the reason why I organize it with this acronym is precisely because die is a very powerful way to basically argue that its edicts is where meritocracy goes to die, right? I mean, literally the death of meritocracy. I mean, imagine that you now have every single uh, grant that you apply for as a professor has to have a die statement. I mean, I mean it really is is difficult. I mean, even though I've said this a thousand times, even though I've written about it in the press like mine, as I say it, I have a hard time believing that this is where we've arrived at, right? So, so you're no longer judged in terms of your grant as in terms of whether you're going to solve some important number theorem, whether you're going to cure cancer, whether you're going to understand the neuronal substrate of consumer choice. I mean, those are all nice, but they are secondary to the really important thing, which is, uh, tell us, Professor, what have you done in the past to advance die causes? And if you win this grant, what are you going to do to advance die causes? Well, I'm going to do nothing to advance die causes because when I hire people, when I mentor them, I don't care. I'll give you, and I discussed this, by the way, in the book. I was approached by a, a business school uh, club that wanted me to speak. They were big fans and they wanted me to speak about, um, you know, how I have served as an ally to women. And my answer was, um, I wasn't an ally to women nor an enemy of women. I am an ally to every single person who is worthy of my mentorship, whether you're a woman or not, or a man or a non-binary or purple or tall or fat or short, uh, to the extent that you exhibit intellectual curiosity and uh, under the guise of my relationship with you as a professor, I am going to be your ally. There isn't any unique thing that I've done to specifically be an ally to women. I mean, if anything, as I explained in the book, my God, is that infantilizing. Women need me to be an ally to succeed. My dean is a woman. She's a great dean. My chair is a woman. My associate dean of research is a woman. Why do I have to be an ally? They should be an ally to me, right? So so it, it infantilizes groups, right? Uh, I present myself to the world as God sad with all my merits and, and all my flaws. I don't present myself as Lebanese Jew war refugee. Of course, I always, I'll share that story so that you could understand my background, but I don't ask you to judge me or punish me or reward me for those characteristics or those personal metrics. I ask you to judge me on the merits of who I am. And it seems amazing to me that all the administrators don't appreciate that, don't understand the difference between equality of outcomes and equality of opportunities. Now, the reality is that I think many of them do understand it, but most are incredible cowards who simply go with how the, you know, the wind blows. And if tomorrow there were sufficient punishment for universities who espouse this kind of nonsense, the administrators would very quickly change their tune. This is why I tell people, activate your inner honey badger, right? Uh, you know, don't sit and you know suck your thumb in a fetal position while crying, right? Uh, your voice matters. You don't have to have a huge platform. When you see nonsense, question it, debate it, politely engage the purveyors of bullshit. But most people are not sufficiently self-confident in their position. So the reason why I use the honey badger is because as many of your viewers probably may or may not know, the honey badger is the size of a small dog, yet it can withstand an attack of six adult lions. The reason why I say six is because there are these great videos on, on YouTube where you could literally see one honey badger intimidating six adult lions. How does it do that? 
it's unbelievably ferocious and fierce. Uh, well, in defending your positions, be fierce. It doesn't mean be violent. It doesn't mean be impolite. But it means that if you have a set of principles that you can articulate and defend well, uh, be a honey badger. That's why when people come after me, they really have to come after me at their at their perils. As I say, if you come after me, don't miss. Because if you miss, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after your ancestors. I'm digging up your dead ancestors. And I am re-killing them, metaphorically speaking. Maybe that's because I'm from the Middle East. Maybe because I'm God sad. But so people are concerned. They, they have a calculus before they come after me. Uh, that's how everybody should live their lives. That's how everybody should be defending their positions. In terms of describing, I think one thing that's important, I think more people have come to terms with this, but still not fully, is that these pathogens that you describe in the parasitic mind are pandemic level existential threats to what you call the edifices of reason. And I thought like if we did a virus chart, one good example I'm using with people is the entire gender identity phenomenon. That just five years ago, things that everybody would have recognized as absurd is now being suggested as compulsory federal law, changing, in fact, the very way we conduct sporting contests around the country to such a degree the South Dakota governor is scared to sign a bill changing the rules on it. Uh, can you describe in particular the, the biophobia that, uh, that you go into related to the whole gender identity insanity that has taken place? So the, the biophobia began at first, as I mentioned earlier in our chat, when I was trying to incorporate evolutionary thinking and understanding human behavior. And people were biophobic because they didn't like the, the, the feeling that you could use biology to explain human behavior, right? So this is what I call, so these are the, the folks who, uh, I call them, they, they stop at the, uh, I can't remember the exact term, but they, the evolution stops at the neck basically, right? So uh, they're perfectly happy to uh, use evolution to explain why we have opposable thumbs. They're perfectly happy to explain, to use evolution to understand why our pancreas has the functional form that it does. But don't you dare, Dr. Saad, say that the most important organ that defines our personhood, this thing called our brain, don't you dare say that comes from biological processes. There's some magical process outside of biology that has created our humanity, right? And it comes really from this reflex that to, to biologize something is to vulgarize it. I mean, don't, don't say that I'm the same as your dog or as your zebra. There's a term for that in the literature. It's called the human reticence effect. You're, you're reticent to use biology to explain human behavior. So that was the original place where I saw this biophobic response, typically amongst social scientists and amongst some natural scientists who in some cases were themselves evolutionary biologists, but they were perfectly happy to use evolution to explain every single species on earth except the behavior of one, humans. So the salamander's mating behavior that could be explained through evolution. But come on, are you some kind of Nazi, Dr. Saad, to use evolutionary theory to explain human mating preferences? Well, where do you think human mating preferences come from, imbecile? There's some magic, well, right? So there they, they, they will equivocate. Oh, no, no, it's culture that causes that. It's socialization. And that's another idea pathogen, social constructivism. The idea that everything is a social construction is another uh, idea pathogen that goes hand in hand with biophobia. So to answer your question about gender identity, what, what happens with the gender, gender ide identitarians is that they reject biology because just like all the other idea pathogens, it's a way to free us from the shackles, the pesky shackles of reality, right? Uh, I don't want to be constrained by my genitalia. I'd like to be able to be anything I want to be. Now, when I say this, I am not making fun or I'm not uh, belittling the very real condition of gender dysphoria. I mean, I'm, I'm about as socially liberal as, as can be. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of transgender rights, as, as I am of any other rights. No person should live under the dark cloud of any bigotry, right? I'm the kid who would stand up for the one being bullied in high school, right? So the fact that I can support transgender rights while being very doggedly offended 
by departures from truth, right? I always tell people I can chew gum and walk at the same time. I can be very progressive in a true sense, in a classical liberal sense, in supporting these causes without ever murdering truth, one inch of truth, right? But when I have to receive emails from countless people who literally write to me saying, Professor, what's the latest on the scientific consensus? Is it only women who menstruate? Can we say that? So if I have to get a functioning adult in the 21st century to write to me so that he or she can get the imprimatur of the professor to convince you whether it is okay to say only women menstruate or not, that's not a good place to be in our zeitgeist. So again, you could be totally for the protection of transgender rights and support the right for, of people to express themselves freely regarding their gender identity, whilst also appearing in front of the Canadian Senate as Jordan Peterson and I appeared and said, hey guys, sure, let's, let's protect everyone, but here are some warnings regarding the proverbial slippery slope. As you probably both know, if you watch that testimony, the Quebec senator, after I had given what I consider to be a very sober testimony, accused me of being a genocidal maniac, <laughs> to, which, to which I responded, it might not be a good idea for you to be labeling a, a pro-genocide guy the one who escaped execution in Lebanon. And then I had heard subsequently that he was trying to get those statements stricken from the record. I don't know if he was able to or not, but that shows you the kind of lunacy that we're facing where someone like me or Jordan can appear in front of the Senate to try to say, hey guys, no, no, there is really such a thing as male or female. It's insane. And we should be able to say that without being accused, accused of being hateful and Nazis and the transphobes and so on. Well, the amazing thing is I've, I've listened to enough of Jordan Peterson, I think, and I've heard enough to know that I've never heard anything remotely misogynistic, xenophobe, uh, intolerant, uh, at all. The only thing I've actually ever heard is uh, the exact opposite. You know, he, there was a one, there's one clip on YouTube where he's talking about, you know, the, the left needs the right and the right needs the left to right the ship because sometimes it leans too far left and too far right. I've never heard, and you know, I, I've seen your tweets, Gad. They're, they are sass, they are snark, uh, typically always within a context of a, of a legit fight that from what I've seen, you don't typically start. Um, wow. But I've never heard. I've never heard either of you say anything. Uh, you said some things that I know by today's standards would be offensive. You know, the, the, the chapter in your book on, on Islam, I know will, will be the one that people could rely on uh, to say that you're promoting intolerant ideas. They said the same thing about Bill Maher and Sam Harris. Um, but the, the, the phenomenal thing is that it's the idea that these pathogens have sort of increased exponentially in modern times. I, I, I wonder if it is the convergence of social media and you know the virtue signaling points that people get on social media and a government that seems endlessly bent on encroaching on individual freedoms for what they perceive to be the, the greater good which merges exactly with this idea of virtue signaling politics um, well it, it's partly that but it's also look it's an accelerator effect right it's an exponential thing i mean cancer starts with one bad cell then it's 12 then it's 3000 then you're dead right? So that's what happens with these idea pathogens. There is no ideological chemotherapy, so to speak, that tries to battle against these cancerous ideas, these parasitic ideas, these infectious ideas. Why? Because, for example, in the universities, and as I discuss in the parasitic mind, if you look at the uh, political affiliation of professors, it's insanely lopsided. I mean, we're not talking about 60-40, right? In most of the activist fields, it's 44 to 1, 44 to 0. Like, you can't find one sociologist who is a Republican or, in the Canadian parlance, a, quote, conservative, right? That's not a good thing, right? Because, now, some, some, some imbeciles will write to me and say, but professor, come on, uh, professors are intelligent. That, that means, of course, they're going to be liberal. <laughs> what an idiotic tautology that is, right? Uh, on certain issues, there are scientific facts. Is there evidence for evolution being the mechanism by which we have biodiversity? It's 
in, incontestable at this point that evolution is correct. Although, by the way, science is always provisional. If tomorrow someone falsifies it, then we go back to the drawing board. But when it comes to issues that we might discuss in a political science class or in a sociology class, is the death penalty a good idea or not? Well, there are really compelling arguments on both sides of that issue, right? I mean, they truly are, right? Uh, you know, uh, what should be the optimal fiscal policy in a country, the monetary policy, the foreign policy? There are very compelling arguments on both sides because they aren't absolute scientific facts where the science is settled. So in having professors who are completely lopsided in their bent, you end up not having the right kind of intellectual diversity that allows for critical thinking to flourish, right? I benefit in having my ideas challenged because now by having that anti-fragility system, it allows the stressors to test my ideas better, right? So, so to answer your question, uh, David, in a long-winded way, the reason why you're seeing such a rapid proliferation of these idea packages, because you really truly get to a tipping point where the thing just explodes, right? It starts off as stage one cancer, but within six months, if not treated, you die. And so this is what's happened. This is why I implore people that we, you could change, you could reverse the ship, but it truly, there's no magic recipe. It involves the assiduous commitment of each individual to have their voices heard. If everybody speaks up in unison, we will solve this problem by next Tuesday. If we don't, it'll be a very slow train ride to hell. And well, one of the things you describe well is the importance of self-education as a tool of self-empowerment, the, the ability of the individual to change things. And in that capacity, talk about nomological networks. Yes. And I like your analogy to law, because as a trial lawyer, I always tell people a lot of these fake narratives are that what Eric Weinstein would describe as the gated institutional narrative, they could never survive in court because we still have rules of evidence that are based on ideas of empiricism and rationality. Exactly. And so- the, could you describe some more of the power of nomological networks sure. that people can utilize? Sure. Thank you for thank you for asking that because it it truly is. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to toot my horn from, from the book, but it really is an epistemological tool that is so profoundly powerful. So, it let me step back a bit. Uh, in in science, we have what are called literature reviews, right? So, a literature review is let's suppose I'm studying the relationship between uh, coffee drinking and asthma. Uh, well, I'd like to know what other people have studied in this area, what other people have found. And so I will contextualize my research within the greater uh, scientific uh, snapshot that exists so far on this phenomenon. So that's a literature review. A meta-analysis is where you take all of those scientific studies on the relationship between coffee drinking and asthma, and you amalgamate them as though they were coming from one mega study, right? Some studies found a positive correlation, some found, some study found no relationship, other studies found a negative correlation. So if I wanna amalgamate them as though they were all stemming from one study, what's the bottom line? Does coffee drinking attenuate uh, or worsen the symptoms of asthma? So that's a meta-analysis. Now, the reason why I'm talking about these two techniques because they are very different from nomological networks, which at first seem as though that it's also the amalgamation of literature review, it isn't. It's actually much more powerful than that. A nomological network of cumulative evidence works as follows. Suppose I have a position that I want to defend and I'm going to take the most incredulous person who is dead set on proving me wrong and I'm going to put on my nomological hat of saying, what would be all of the data sources that I could generate that would drown that person in a tsunami of evidence. So could I get cross-cultural data to support my position? Could I get cross-temporal data, meaning across time? Could I, got, could I get cross-species data? Could I show that across animals, we have this regular phenomenon happening? Could I get cross-disciplinary data, cross-paradigm data? In other words, what I'm doing is I'm building this, literally this tsunami of evidence that then makes it unassailable to argue against me. And maybe a concrete example might help, if if I may. Is that is that okay? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So I, I in the in chapter seven, I give both uh, some scientific examples of the homological networks, and then I end up by building a homological network for Islam. So let's take one of the scientific examples. Let's suppose I wanted to prove to you. Let's suppose you were both social constructivists. Everything is due to social construction. 
So you are one of those who is parasitized by social constructivism. And you specifically would like to argue that toy preferences are socially constructed, which most social scientists do exactly that. So they say the reason why little boys and little girls grow up to be, you know, whomever they become is starts off with their, you know, sexist patriarchal parents giving them, you know, gender conforming sex toys, uh, sex specific toys. So uh, little, little John. Johnny receives the blue truck or the GI little Linda receives the pink doll and that starts the cascade of gender role expectations. So let's suppose I want to now come along and prove to you that no, David and Robert, you're, you're wrong. Actually, there are biological reasons for these sex specific toys. How would I go about drowning you in evidence? Okay, so let, so I, I won't build the entire nomological network, but I'll give you enough that you will see how the epistemological mechanism works. So I can get you data from developmental psychology where the children who were tested in terms of their toy preferences were tested in their pre-socialization developmental stage, meaning that they didn't yet have the cognitive development to be socialized, but yet they already reach to their sex-specific toys in the way that you would predict. So already you are falsifying the idea that it is socialization that's causing those toy preferences. So already that one piece of evidence is enough to destroy the social constructivist position. But if I'm building a nomological network, I don't want to give you a two meter wave. I want to drown you in a hundred foot wave of evidence. So let's go with the next piece of evidence. Let's suppose I showed you that vervet monkeys, rhesus monkeys, and chimpanzees exhibit the same sex specificity in their toy preferences. You can't argue that vervet monkey parents are sexist patriarchal pigs, right? Therefore, the fact that there is a uh, uh, convergence across species is certainly pointing to the fact that there is a biological mechanism. I could take children who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is an endocrinological disorder. If little girls suffer from it, their morphological features become masculinized. Their behavioral patterns become masculinized. So I can take little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia. I could study their toy preferences, as has been done, and I could show that their toy preferences become akin to those of boys. Now, so I've gotten you right now data from developmental psychology, from comparative psychology, meaning across animals, from pediatric endocrinology. Now you might say, well, what about across cultures? All these cultures are from the West. Well, I could get you data from incredibly non-Western societies, nomadic tribes in the, in the Sahara and Northern Africa, where it's the exact same sex specificity of toy preferences. Yeah, but Dr. Saad, those are all contemporary societies. Well, I can get you data from ancient Greece, where they did a content analysis of funerary monuments, where the children are being depicted on those funerary monuments, and they're depicted with the exact same toy preferences of today. So bit by bit, I will put the epistemological noose around your neck so that you're finished, you're cooked. That's what allows me to navigate the world and hopefully forevermore be non-cancelable because I'm not hysteric. I don't engage in hyperbolic insanity. I don't scream louder than others. I say, okay, let's take your position. Let's take mine. Let me do my homework. And when, I'm when I come back, I'm going to turn you into an oblivious schmuck because I'm going to drown you in my facts. Now, on the other hand, when I don't know something, that's, you know, it's an important part of chapter seven where I say how to seek truth. Part of also being a truth seeker is to have epistemic humility, meaning that when I have built a nomological network, I walk with the swagger of someone who knows what I'm talking about. But on the other hand, there's an endless number of things that I know next to nothing about. So that if you guys were to ask me, well, you know, you're Canadian. What do you think about the legalization of marijuana that Justin Trudeau instituted? And I would say, well, gentlemen, that's a great question. But unfortunately, I haven't thought about it enough. I haven't built the requisite nomological network. I don't know enough about it. So that creates great trust between me and the audience, whether it be my, my audience on YouTube or whether it be my students, because to stand up on the podium when you could easily be pretending that you know everything and say, hey, Good question, 20-year-old kid, undergrad. I don't know the answer to your question. Why don't you send me an email? Let me do my homework. That immediately shows that young student 
that you're not so haughty as to fake it that you always know what you know so when i know i know and when i don't know what i know i don't know and nomological networks is a great way of making sure that your ducks are in order when you're constructing an argument well here i'm gonna get i'm gonna get uh one question out then read the super chat because they're sort of intertwined but someone's yeah. gonna say the response to your nomological nomological network is going to be okay sure even if you're right, it's the same thing as with, you know, the, the argument that vegetarians put forward. Uh, I don't care that animals do it also. We are enlightened species. So even if that's the case, we should rise above it and tear it down. Um, and then bringing it up to this chat, which is sort of related is, Gad, you said you're a proponent of trans rights. What sort of rights do you have in mind? If I'm anti-trans, what are my rights to live my truth? If any, question for Viva and Barnes as well. So I mean, well, the, the one retort is going to be, despite all of your nomological proof, we're better than that, and so we should re we should sort of either destroy or just reconstruct for yeah. the enlightened uh, beings that we are as humans. Uh, the 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 we're better than that is what is commonly referred to as the naturalistic fallacy. What you know, mixing the is and ought, right? What when I'm saying that animals exhibit behavioral convergence in comparison to our behavior. I'm not arguing that it is morally good to do so or bad. I'm not arguing that boys should play with toys or not. It is one data point amongst many others to demonstrate that there is biological based evidence for this behavior, right? So th the question that the person is raising, well, animals do it, but that doesn't mean that we should do it, is entering the moral uh, framework of what, you know, the difference between what we ought to do versus what we do do, what we describe behavior versus normative behavior. That's not what the nomological network is trying to do. The nomological network is simply saying, what would be all of the evidence that I can gather in support of my position? Now, let's suppose that that gentleman's position were vertical, were true, that the animal box is not convincing. Even if that were true, which I don't concede the point, I my nomological network has 600 other boxes so all that he is saying is i gave you a tsunami of 180 feet that's going to drown you well let's adjust it to 178 feet of evidence because two of the feet of evidence i am contesting guess what you're still going to drown in the evidence you follow what i mean that's why the nomological network is an incredibly disciplined epistemology because it says I'm really putting myself, it's a form of theory of mind. I want to put myself in the mind of my worst, most hostile critic and then say, what would be the evidence that I must amass so that that person would come around to seeing things my way? So even if I concede the animal one, I'm still drowning you with 6,000 other pieces of evidence. Yeah, I mean, what you're describing heavily in the, is what a good trial lawyer does in terms of a nomological network. The uh, it, it's to to take cross from a wide range of spaces and areas to show how uniform the evidentiary uh, th uh, thematic structure is by showing the actual data. And you also reference sort of the the sword, the utility of the sword of satire. Uh, recently used it yourself uh, in suggesting that maybe we needed to get rid of data for the sake of unity. Uh, in the in the uh, in the context of the Asian American hoax, that's going yes. to be the institutional narrative. Could you describe the critical tool that satire provides and must be protected against? As we see places like the New York Times go after the Babylon Bee, as an example. Yeah. So uh, th that's that's precisely why I have a section in my book about the power of satire. Because look, satire, I analogize it to the surgeon's scalpel cutting through warm butter, right? What does satire do? It just cuts through endless archeological layers of bullshit, right? That's why when dictators come to power, they don't first get rid of guys with big muscles. They get rid of guys with big brains. They get rid of guys with sharp tongues because they are the ones who are the greatest threat to my ideological edifice as a dictator, right? The, the muscle guys, I mean, will shoot them, but ideas are more difficult. So powerful trenchant satire is exactly problematic to ideologues because it highlights so beautifully the insanity of your positions. And 
I mean, luckily for me, and I remember very vividly as a young child, my mother, there's, there are expressions in Arabic saying, my God, you have such a sharp tongue. Because it just, again, was part of my, luckily or not, it was part of my makeup to kind of see absurdities and just mock them to death. Uh, and, and Arabic is a very powerful, maybe I was fortunate enough to, to have Arabic as my mother tongue because it has its own sort of flowery cadence and rhythm and so on. And so satire is really the, 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 the epitome of maximal persuasion strategies. Now, some imbeciles will oftentimes say, but you know, isn't it beneath you as a professor to engage in, my God, you don't get it, man. I am in the business of fighting bad ideas. Sometimes I can be as austere and professorial as one could imaginably be. If I'm giving a talk at Stanford Business School, uh, I am professorial. If I am engaging some guy on Twitter, I could be wrestling with, you know, pigs in the, the proverbial, you know, mud pool. In other words, I have sufficient behavioral plasticity to know when to use which strategy to achieve maximal success. I mean, and someone who is a professor in the marketing department. You would think I should know that, right? Because you don't target all consumers using the exact same message, right? That's why we have a thing called targeting, segmenting the market, niches, right? So satire is not, the, of course, the only tool to use. But if you're able to do it and pull it off, it is an incredibly powerful tool. By the way, it confuses the Cretans. It confuses AI systems, as we discussed earlier, <laughs> to my benefit and to my detriment. It confuses, look, I, I, I could, for any position that you accuse me of, oh, I'm a, I'm a this phobe or that phobe, I can point you to a hundred tweets that I put up where I'm not going to say whether I'm being satirical or not. I could very conceivably use as a defense, say, what are you talking about? I love Islam. Islam is the path forward. Islam is the solution. I'm not being satirical, and you don't know if I'm being satirical or not. There's no right now. You don't know if I'm being satirical. I've actually put out a a a, a message at one point where I abrogated using the Quranic principle of abrogation. Abrogation, for those of you who don't know, when there are two statements in the Quran that contradict each other, the later statement nullifies the early one. It abrogates it. And so I put out a statement where I abrogated any previous possible criticisms I might have said about Islam and my current position. That is a Quranic principle that I fully support. So if you accuse me of being in any way critical of Islam, that can't be true because I've abrogated my position. So satire is for those who have a big this and a sharp that. And we should be honoring those who could pull it off, pull it off rather than critiquing them. Well, I, I just, you know, the, the one risk of satire is that sometimes, you know, like people say on Twitter, don't give them any ideas, is you make a joke, and then sure enough, a year later, the joke has become reality. Um, geez, Babylon B had one, and I forget what it was, if someone in the chat remembers, but, you know, quite literally, uh, I, I can't think of the example right now, but quite literally, satire a year ago has become reality because, you know, it, it, the joke the joke never ends to some extent. Uh, well, the by, by the way, the mechanism, so when I often state, as I did, I think, earlier on, on this show, that my satire is prophetic, th there's really no magic to how I do this. The way I do it, it's, it really it requires a particular cognitive mindset, which is you try to extrapolate from the current position the most extreme boundary condition. You satirize that, you satirize that position you fold your finger, your hands, and then you wait for reality to catch up. That's what prophetic sat uh, satire is. So the fact that I repeatedly do that is precisely because I understand the mindset of the enemies of reason, and therefore I could go on the joyride on the slippery slope of, of insanity and meet them at the bottom of the hill. You follow? And therefore that's why, whether it be the Babylon B, which I'm sure they're engaging in a similar process, Maybe they can't enunciate it using the language that I just did, but that's effectively what a good satirist is doing. It's they're mocking the end result of the stupidity. You know, we got one here, which was, oh, no, sorry, wrong. BLM. <laughs> I mean, 
They, they, uh, oh, there's, there, there's been a bunch, but yeah, the, the Babylon Bee's been particularly on point sometimes. Robert, you have, you have, uh, Gad, I don't want to keep you for too long. What time do you need to go? Maybe in the next uh, 10 minutes at most. Okay. We've got half an hour more, so there you go. That's perfect. Okay, Robert, you got a question? Uh, yeah, I mean, you go into the incompatibility of Sharia law principles with uh, constitutional principles, enlightenment ideals, et cetera. And I remember when I first looked at this, I thought, well, that's not something we'll ever have to worry about. And then we discovered the problems around Detroit and things that were happening there and so on and so forth. Could you describe why Sharia law principles are just incompatible with American ideals? Right. Well, I, I actually go further. I compare Sharia law to progressive values. And I argue that they are, in their structure, they are identical. They're un, undifferentiable, if, if that's a word. Undifferentiated, let's put it that way. Uh, so Sharia law codifies that a crime, the punishment of the crime, varies as a function of the identity of the perpetrator and the victim. There's literally, and I, I, I have those as direct quotes from the, the original Sharia, the kind of definitive Sharia manual. Uh, so Muslim man kills Jewish woman is very different from Jewish woman kills Muslim man, right? They are even translational. You know, it's one eighth this, one fourth that. So the, the value of human life is codified in fractional, you know, currency. Well, isn't that exactly what? Well, so first of all, to answer your first question, doesn't isn't that perfectly antithetical to Western jurisprudence that says, well, why does uh, Lady Justice or whatever her name is, uh, have the blindfold? She's blind to those metrics. Now, it's not always perfect, but at least deontologically, she's supposed to be blind to those metrics, to those immutable traits, and so on. Well, progressive calculus does the same thing, right? It says, wait a minute, who said the N-word? Oh, let's see, what's your what's your skin you? Aha, it's light. You're, oh, you're Middle Eastern? Okay, well, some people called you sand N-word, as I was called all the time when I played soccer. So do I get a pass to say the N-word or I don't? Now, you, you don't, Robert, it's, you better not say it. Well. So that is codifying the exact penchant of Sharia law. It says a crime is not a crime irrespective of who commits it. A crime varies in its severity and in its punishment and its retribution as a function of the, the traits of the victim. So, I mean, that's exactly it. The progressive stack, which is who gets to speak first in a group setting, as a function of their victimology, oh, you're indigenous trans, you speak first. Shut up, white guy. You're cis normative, right? I mean, that's Sharia law. Now, as I explained in the parasitic mind, the only thing that changes is how we punish you, right? So in one case, we behead you. In the other case, we behead your reputation or your job. But the, it, this, the, the semantic and logical structure of both legal systems is identical. That's why progressivism is akin to Sharia law. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an interesting analogy and, and it does get you thinking about, you know, the, the hate crime provisions of law, which uh, attribute different sanctions depending on the identities, the motivation behind the same act, the same crime, uh, you know, committed uh, under different circumstances. Um, I mean, I guess the, the, maybe the last or end of the line questions are, you say that, you know, the idea pathogens are like a cancer and they spread exponentially. I guess the question is, we know how we treat cancer in a body. How do you treat ideological cancers without, without killing the host? Uh, and the host in which case is what? The university? No, I would say the host is going to be society as a whole to some extent. How, how do you excise the, what, you're, what you have qualified as these ideological pathogens uh, you know, while maintaining a functioning society or in order to preserve a functional society. So you, you, you need to go back to defending all of the foundational values that have made the West the liberating place that people like me could escape the Middle East and come to, right? Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, defense of individual dignity, right? 
uh, no collectivism, no tribalism, the supremacy of the scientific method as the only way to adjudicate issues of science, the, uh, the honoring of critical thinking, the rejection of uh, faddish anti-scientific uh, frameworks that are taught in the humanities and in the social sciences. So again, there's no magic recipe. Uh, in the same way that chemotherapy can be brutal on the body, right? It can make you feel very sick, you lose your hair, but ultimately you have to do it in order to defeat the spread of the cancer. Ideological battles are can get nasty, can get brutal, you might lose friends, you might get canceled, but you can't subcontract your voice to others. What ends up happening is most people will write to me privately. And I mean, literally more people than uh, you could fathom who will say, you know, say all these super nice things. And then they always end with the last sentence. Oh, and please, professor, if you're going to read this on your YouTube channel, make sure to not identify me. So if you don't even have the courage to stand up publicly to the one who is doing the dirty work on your behalf so that your, your children can grow up in free societies. Aren't you really part of the problem? So th th there is no way to fight these the proliferation of these idea pathogens without each of us saying, look, I have a part to play. And, and if, I understand Joe Rogan has a much bigger part in that he's got 20 million download uh, you know, per show. Therefore, his voice is going to spread much more quickly than someone who you know has two people that listen to him but everybody has the capacity within their sphere of influence to affect change your professor says something that is insane challenge them politely uh, you are a donor who's got tons of money write to your fundraising office at the university and say if you keep up with this mandatory critical race stuff bye bye my five million dollars guess what they'll pay attention Every single one has to use all possible tools at their disposal to get engaged. If you subcontract your voice, then you are a coward who is literally part of the reason why these ideological cancers are spreading. So I would simply implore people to get educated, to grow a pair, to find if they actually have a spine, you can't be an octopus. You can't be an invertebrate. You are mammalian. You're vertebrate. You have this thing called a spine. Grow a spine. Grow a pear. Activate your inner honey badger. Don't diffuse the responsibility on a few people who are willing to take all the risk for you. Diversify the risk. When you go to MBA school, the first thing you learn in finance class is if you want to have a successful diversification uh, uh, investment strategy, diversify right so diversify the risk don't put it on 10 people who are willing to speak out on behalf of all of us if all of us speak out we, we can't all be canceled and so just implement these things and believe me in the same and as quickly as the 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 berlin wall collapsed that's how quickly this nonsense can go away otherwise we're truly in for a long haul to help all right. Uh, that might be one heck of a way to end it. Um, Gat, stick around. Robert, stick around. We'll say our proper goodbyes. Everyone in the chat, thank you for tuning in. Gad, we do it again. And uh, maybe if our government ever lets us uh, leave the house again, we can we can do it in person over coffee. Thank you, guys. That was great. Right. Everyone, everyone have a good day. Cheers.